In today's video, we're going to be discussing whether or not drill batteries are safe. Will they burn my house down? What about all the news reports that I see where power tool batteries have failed? Well, I've got some non-comforting answers for you, so let's get started with today's video. So in the last video, we rebuilt this battery so that way it can work with a tool again. And uh, I pointed out to you how this pack along with the Craftsman pack did not necessarily have a battery management system in it, but merely a monitor board with a fuse. And then I suspected that the Black & Decker battery pack had cells with a poly switch inside of them. So with no output FETs and no real control over the pack, is a drill battery safe? And most drill batteries are made that way. So is the drill battery safe? Well, let's talk about how the drill batteries work. So drill batteries, power tool batteries are made to be part of a system. So the tool, the battery, and then the charger. So whereas the battery cannot act for itself, the tool and the charger can. So uh, for instance, plugging this Black & Decker battery into this drill here, you see that there is this battery indicator. The drill knows what the output voltage of the Black & Decker battery is. So when the voltage gets too low, the pack doesn't cut off. The tool will cut the output off. So the tool controls the cell under voltage or the under voltage of the drill uh, battery. Along with the thermistor, it does have the ability to monitor the thermistor. If it gets too hot, the tool will no longer try to draw current from the battery. Likewise for the charger. The charger knows what the voltage of the battery is. And I pointed out before that there is a cell monitoring board in here that can send out a signal if one of the cells gets into over voltage. If you remember from the very first video of the drill battery rebuild series where we took a look and diagnosed the packs, one of the cells was greatly below the rest of them. The rest of them were going into cell over voltage during charge. That was signaling the charger not to charge the battery pack. So. Uh, when you plug it in, it can monitor the thermistor. It has that signal line from that cell monitor, and then it can also read the pack voltage. So uh, there is safety when using the battery and then safety when charging the battery. So that is how a drill system is supposed to work or a power tool system is supposed to work, but there are a few flaws with it. So let's talk about those. So I do have a few problems with this kind of architecture. So looking at, well, let's say the power tool, you have a drill or a saw or something, and its responsibility is to monitor the battery voltage when it's going. The battery voltage dips low enough, the tool cuts off. The tool will no longer try to draw current out of the battery pack. But what if it's off calibration? One got out of the factory out of calibration, or the tool just, just been dropped so many times it knocks something loose, and uh, it no longer properly reads the battery voltage. It could drive the cells way into cell under voltage below their threshold and you would never know it. Same thing with the thermistor. If the thermistor reading for the tool started to mess up and it could no longer properly read the thermistor in the battery, the battery could get way too hot, the tool would never know it, and you might never know it if you're out in the sun and you're just working away. Same thing with the charger if you have a rogue charger. If it starts to push too much current, not the current limit of the fuse or of the poly switch built into the cell, but uh, too much current for the cell to handle, and uh, it just starts pushing current, the cell, the battery pack can't do anything about it. So you may have a thermal event. Same thing with the temperature. If the charger stops reading the temperature properly, what happens to the pack? So those are a few flaws, not necessarily unsafe things, but a few flaws that could happen in this kind of architecture. Well, Alex, don't drill batteries have to be tested to safety standards? Glad you asked. I actually have notes on the subject conveniently located in this drawer. Don't know how they got there, but they are there topped up ready for this video about testing. What do you know? But in the United States, there is only one required testing standard, and that is um, UN 38.3. UL and IEC and ANSI and all those kind of standards are all voluntary unless you're in uh, specialized medical or intrinsically safe or things like that. For general industrial batteries and things, 
UN 38.3 transport testing is the only thing that is required for batteries in the United States. Now, looking up the specs on the Black & Decker battery and on the Craftsman battery, I could only find their safety data sheets. And so their safety data sheets only said that they were UN 38.3 tested. I could not find any kind of UL testing or IEC testing. Again, that's not required in the United States, but I'm just saying I couldn't find it. So I'm making this assumption. If I'm wrong, please don't sue me. I couldn't find any more information, but I just assume that these battery packs with no markings and things um, outside of what you're supposed to have are only tested to transport certification. So let's go through transport and see what it is for a battery pack like this or any battery pack in the United States. Now, if you'd like to follow along, you can look the standard up online. It's the United Nations Manual of Test and Criteria. This is Revision 8, Section 38, Subsection 3, Lithium Metal and Lithium Ion and Sodium Batteries. Now, there are eight different tests, uh, T1 through T8, for rechargeable batteries that have cells that are already tested. You only have to do T1 through T5 and then T7. So, we're going to talk about those briefly. Uh, one thing to note, T1 through T5 have to be done in order to the same pack. So when I'm talking about T1 through T5, that's the same pack going through those five tests. So uh, T1 is uh, altitude simulation. That's for if uh, the battery pack is going up into a plane. So uh, the test procedure, test cells and batteries shall be stored at a pressure of 11.6 kilopascal or less for at least six hours at ambient temperature. And they take it up and then back down. And it happens so many times. But the requirement is what I want you to see. And the requirement stays the same up until you get to T5, which is cells and batteries meet this requirement if there is no leakage, no venting, no disassembly, no rupture, no fire. And if the open circuit voltage of each test or battery after testing is not less than 90% of its voltage immediately prior to this procedure. So uh, we always say here at PTI, the pack's got to be fully operational. Okay, that's, that's, if it passes test, it's still fully operational. That's, that's basically what it's saying. Uh, number two is the thermal test. So T2 is the thermal test. That's to assess that the cell and battery seal integrity and the internal electrical connections. Uh, the test conducted using rapid and extreme temperature changes. So they take it up to 72 degrees C, then back down to 40 degrees C in like a 30 minute window. And they do that um, 10 different times. And then the requirements are the same as before. Uh, the pack must be fully operational. Now, T3 vibration. And oh boy. Oh boy. When we're talking about shock and vibe, Oh boy, this, this, is a, this is a little bit of a rougher test. They take the battery pack and they mount it to a platform and they mount it, they'll mount it three different ways and run the test three different times. And that platform sits and it'll shake uh, between seven and 200 uh, hertz um, for 15 minutes at a time and it, it, to, to simulate transporting a battery pack and see if it'll come apart. And oh boy, when you're working with big battery packs, sometimes they come apart. So it, it goes up, uh, I think it goes from 1G to 8Gs for small battery packs and then 1G to 2Gs uh, for um, larger battery packs. Again, requirement, pack has to be fully operational after this. And then you get to the shock test. And the shock test, like the vibration test, uh, is meant to simulate transportation of the, of the battery pack. So uh, what they have is a platform and it usually uh, raises up and then it will accelerate down at some predetermined rate and then slam into its base to simulate a shock. Uh, and so I can't, uh, I can't begin to tell you how the shock test is supposed to work. So you can read over this, uh, this paper if you'd like to. Now, everything up to this point is um, external testing to the battery pack, not just drill batteries, but any battery sold in the United States. Um, so the next two are electrical tests. Now, short circuit testing, that's pretty self-explanatory. You take the output and you short it out. It's not supposed to heat up uh, to a certain thing. And th there are a lot of different requirements. It's not supposed to have fire and disassembly. But in the requirements, it doesn't have to be fully operational. It just uh, doesn't need to overheat, basically, in the short circuit testing. So with a fuse or a poly switch, you sort of pack like this out. It'll pass short circuit testing. Now to the, uh, the overcharge testing, which is T7. You don't have to do T6 or T8 with a rechargeable battery like this, but you do have to do T7. And uh, the purpose of this test is to evaluate the ability of a rechargeable battery or single rechargeable battery to withstand an overcharge condition. So what they do if your um, 
charge voltages is below 18 volts, you uh, double your charge voltage uh, to the maximum charge voltage of the battery or 22 volts as in section A, or if it's above 18 volts, you go to 1.2 times. They had to change this back in the day because um, uh, they were, you know, doubling it. The, the problem is chipsets for smaller batteries can't take 40 volts or they can't take 20 volts. They're just not made to do that. And so you're blowing chips off of safety circuits. So that changed that a few years back. But the requirement, rechargeable batteries must meet its requirement if there is no disassembly and no fire during the test within seven days after test. Now these are the only two electrical tests contained in UN 38.3, which is the only standard that is mandatory for the United States unless you're in some special category. A short circuit is nothing special, passed out with a fuse all day long. But uh, passing over voltage is a, uh, is a little bit different. Overcharge is a little bit harder. Now, the secret to passing this is when it says no disassembly or fire. So section 38.2.3 defines disassembly as a rupture of the cell or battery case where solid components are ejected. Now, a good quality cell, and I want to say this specifically, a good quality cell, when it's subject to these conditions, will um, vent. The CID inside of the cell will open up and then let the pressure out, electrolyte, electrolyte, excuse me, will leak out, and then the cell will be physically disconnected on the inside, uh, unable to provide any more current or any more wattage uh, on the output. So that's not a failure, only um, if a solid component leaves the battery pack. So that's how you get through uh, transport testing with a pack that is designed like this. And a good quality drill pack will pass transport testing every single time. So um, these packs like this have passed the United States standard for testing. So that's the only standard that the United States has in general is UN 38.3. And it is not a rigorous electrical safety standard. It is for transportation. So then what about drill batteries or other batteries that are sold in the United States? Not just drill batteries. Are they safe or will they burn my house down? So my answer is yes, in general, drill batteries are safe. Transport testing is not a good measure of the safety of the actual battery pack for consumer use or for um, industrial use. It is just a transportation standard. Something like IEC 62133 or uh, any of the UL standards are a lot better at doing that. But um, as far as the pack being safe, I have Craftsman batteries at my own house. I charge them in my own house. I use them in my own house. I don't take them out in the freezing cold. I don't leave them in the scorching sun. I always uh, find a uh, shadow to put them under somewhere. Uh, if they are discharged, I always try to charge them and not leave them in a discharge state on a shelf. And then when they're charging, I always try to keep an eye on them. And I do not charge batteries when I'm not at the house. Those are just some good rules to follow to keep the battery pack happy and to make sure that nothing happens to it. If you're going to have a cell fault inside of any kind of lithium battery, whether it's in your phone, whether it's in some kind of toy, whether it's in a drill battery, if a cell fault happens, it doesn't matter how fancy your BMS is, the pack is going to go into thermal runaway anyway. So even though I don't like the architecture, again, something happens to the tool, the tool goes rogue, the battery pack is subject to abuse, the charger goes rogue, the battery pack is subject to abuse. As long as you keep an eye on everything, I think drill batteries in general are safe for use. And one major thing that I worry about about drill batteries is the DC adapters that go on the battery pack and then provide two wires out so you can use drill batteries in whatever project you want to and it'll be great. But the problem is now you don't have any safety for the pack outside of the overcurrent stuff that's built in. You now no longer have the low voltage disconnect of the tool and you uh, no longer have uh, the safety of the charger because some people decide to, to just plug it up to whatever to charge it. It's Again, the architecture, I'm not the biggest fan of it, but like this, I would consider it safe. But you go throw one of them adapters in it and uh, now you've just bypassed everything this system does and you've made this battery pack of great risk to yourself. So don't be afraid of the drill batteries. If you buy OEM uh, batteries, which I always recommend, buy uh, original manufacturer batteries, whether it's Craftsman or DeWalt or Milwaukee or whatever, I'm going to say you're going to be just fine. There's millions of them out in the world. 
and the fires that have happened are either with cheap batteries or just kind of a one-off thing. I think you'll be just fine. Don't abuse them. Make sure you respect and take care of them. And I think they'll take care of you. They really won't take care of you. They have no ability to take care of you. If you go in a home, they're not coming to visit you. They will not come to visit you. So if you enjoyed today's video, I enjoyed making it. Hopefully you learned something. So uh, hopefully you won't be as afraid of your drill batteries as you once were. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And uh, I will see everybody in the next video.